Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Musical Inner Tube. I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Tim Payne. You know, Don's had quite a career in radio and television, where he's been an air personality, a news anchor, even a TV weatherman. And John has been a college professor. He's written several books, and he's been an editor and features writer at the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. We first teamed up for a radio show in college. On one show, we introduced a soothing musical interlude. But we stumbled, and it came out musical inner two. And that became the name for this podcast, where we talk with interesting people about their interesting lives, difference makers who really make a difference. Our guest today is Dick Pullman, Maury Povich, writer in residence and professor of journalism at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's been since 2006. Uh, I first knew Dick as the national political writer and columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I had the privilege of being his editor for a couple of years. And he was also a great political columnist uh, for uh, WHYY-FM. And uh, we welcome you to the podcast, Dick. Thanks so much, John. I can also say, uh, if uh, anybody is still interested in uh, reading anything that I have to say, um, I have my own uh, um, syndicated column uh, on a website, uh, dickpolman.net. And, well, I'm glad uh, you mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned that, Dick, because I wanted to ask you a question about one of your most recent columns. Oh, excellent. Uh, yeah, and it has uh, the following headline: Catholic Ireland is more progressive than America about abortion. Period. Think about that. Really. Period. Uh, take it away, Dick. <laughs> yeah, well, that was uh, that was that piece uh, I posted early this morning, uh, and I, I, I think the the genesis of that was uh, Roe versus Wade being uh, thrown out on Friday in the Supreme Court, uh, and uh, because I had other things going on in my life, I couldn't write about it uh, this weekend <laughs> as much as I wanted to. But uh, uh, meanwhile, you know, it's been uh, chewed up fifty time fifty thousand times over by everybody, and so you you reach Monday morning and you think. Now, what can I possibly say or what possible angle uh, can I come up with that maybe the other 50 people, 1,000 people uh, haven't thought of yet? And I always tell my students at Penn, the journalism students, you know, you got to find ways to cut through the clutter. Um, so uh, I decided actually to draw on some personal experience of my own because I was a foreign correspondent uh, for the Philadelphia Inquirer in the early 90s. Uh, and I did a, a Sunday magazine story about uh, uh, the Irish sort of falling out with their church circa 1995. And it was amazing how many people I spoke to at the time who were um, upset with the church in part because of its uh, stance on abortion, particularly young Irish. So uh, that was kind of the uh, the background uh, to uh, my talking about the fact that in 2018, uh, Ireland had had a, a stage of national referendum, uh, and uh, a landslide percentage of voters, sixty four percent, voted to uh, legalize abortion in uh, Catholic Ireland. And I guess the point I was making in my column was I never expected to see the day where we would be considered uh, the uh, less progressive nation than Ireland, and that young people in Ireland always uh, look to to us as uh, you know. Uh, the haven of liberation, and now uh, maybe they'll just want to stay away from us. Yeah, America used to be um, a place to go when you wanted to escape the backwardness of Ireland, either America or England. And and now it uh, looks like uh, in the three-way race, Ireland is getting a nose up in front, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. The only there were exit polls on that uh, uh, on that uh, referendum, and um, only only people, uh, the only majority that keeping abortion illegal. Uh, the only majority for that was uh, voters uh, over the age of 65. So every other age bracket, uh, you know, wanted to sort of join the 21st century. Let's let's talk a little bit about that because, uh, of course, one of the big uh, takeaways from the Supreme Court action on on uh, Roe versus Wade is that a majority of Americans still want uh, abortion available. Uh, also, the Supreme Court came out with their hearing or with their uh, results rather on the uh, the gun law in New York, allowing anybody to take a gun outside anywhere for any purpose right after the shootings in Texas. It seems like the Supreme Court is going this way and everybody else is going the other way. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this has been, well, just to speak for a second about those two decisions, Thursday and Friday. You know, on the one hand, on Thursday, 
uh, the majority was saying, the conservative majority was saying that, uh, you know, states really don't have the right to, uh, to, uh, uh, regulate, uh, uh, people who want to carry guns. And then on Friday, they turned around saying, yes, yeah, states have every right to, uh, regulate or, or curb abortion. So, you know, they're going one way on federalism and then the other way the next day. Um, but the broader, I think the broader answer to your question, this is something I've thought about a lot or written a, a few times about is that, uh, you know, you can, what, what we're, the way the court is constituted now, uh, it all started. This was, sort of the culmination of a 40 year project, uh, that, uh, the, uh, Republic conservative Republicans, evangelicals, um, have been plotting. And I don't mean plotting as, as a conspiracy way. I mean, just in terms of planning, uh, for a very, very long time, you know, they think about the long game and you could, you know, you can trace it back if you want for really to, to, uh, Ronald Reagan's election in, uh, 1980 when, uh, the religious right first got, uh, uh, first showed their power, uh, and turned the Senate Republican. Uh, and, uh, that was what that's, that was, uh, seven years after Roe v. Wade. Uh, and so their idea all along was to basically get a hold of the judiciary. Uh, and it wasn't like they were hiding it. I mean, this was all done in plain sight. And, you know, so, and it wasn't just federal elections. I mean, I think the important thing to remember also is that, and I give them credit for thinking ahead and for, uh, you know, looking at every vulnerable place in our, in our system, state legislative races, you know, the races for state senator and state rep in every state, uh, and what they've done since, uh, 2010 in particular, uh, to win state legislative races and the, and the Democrats, have been always, always reactive, playing catch up, not bothering to play catch up. Uh, and then in terms of the federal races, to get back to that for a second, the Supreme Court, they've always made the Supreme Court a, um, uh, a, 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 a first priority campaign issue. Uh, and the Democrats have never, they've never done that. And it, so it's like, you know, it was out there and, you know, they were basically saying, uh, you know, we, we, that was one of their organizing principles that despite the fact that there were various factions in the Republican party, all those years, one of the things they were all united on was, you know, we want to be able to dominate the Supreme court. And I, I think if you wanted to really see it in its, at its most uh, vivid example was 2016. So Donald Trump comes along. He's, he's a philanderer who worships money and he's amoral and he lies through his teeth every second of the day, you would think, at least in theory, that uh, the, uh, the, the the Christian right, the evangelicals within the Republican Party, uh, would recoil from such a person, uh, particularly after he was caught, you know, on those on those tapes saying those things about women. Uh, but no, and the reason that they didn't was because they saw that he was going to be, uh, you know, a, a possibly very useful vehicle for getting what they wanted, and and he. Promised he was going to give them what he want, what they wanted. And, you know, Hillary Clinton, uh, every once in a while, she would say, you know, the Supreme Court is at stake here. Uh, and, you know, we've got to, we have to have people on there who will protect Roe versus Wade, 50 years of precedent, et cetera. Uh, but never with the same fervor and, uh, as the Republicans. And if you look at, uh, uh, the exit polls, uh, for the 2016 election, and, and, and the way it was broken down. And if you looked at the people who prioritized the Supreme Court as the number one issue, they were overwhelmingly voting Trump over Clinton. So there's a lot of factors over a long period of time here that come into play. And, uh, you know, I, I, it, a lot of it just comes down to, you know, Democrats just don't, they don't play, you know, they they play checkers where the other team plays chess. And so, you know, everybody's fulminating now about what's happening and the Democrats are saying, and this may be anticipating a question that you all will ask, uh, and we can get into that. Um, now the Democrats are saying, okay, well, now we've got to, we're going to rally around and make this a big issue for the midterms. Uh, but it's, it's like, you know, the horse has left the barn and, right. uh, you know, it's all they got left again is to be reactive. Well, uh, let's let's ask that question. Thank you so much, Dick, uh, for suggesting it. Uh, it makes me have to work less hard. But seriously, uh, do you think that this could have some impact in November? Well, yes, it could. You know, it, it, one of the things I've one of the things I've learned I've le I've learned the hard way is I never want to make 
uh, uh, flat out predictions because sure. one of the th- one, one of the things uh, one, one of the things that I do to torture myself <clears throat> is I remember in 2016, University of Pennsylvania, in its wisdom, uh, s- they sent me over to Europe to talk to give talks in the fall of 2016 to the Penn alumni clubs in London, Paris, and Brussels. And the title of my talk going over there was "The Seven Reasons Why Hillary Clinton Will Win the Election." So, you know, I've been, I've been beating myself up over that over since, even though I had a lot of company that year. Um, so having, having said all that, um, I am seeing, uh, polling results. Uh, there's a new one today. I can't remember whose it is, CBS, NPR. I'm not sure which, uh, saying that, um, when, uh, when people are now asked as a generic sense, would you rather have uh, a Republican Congress or a Democratic Congress? A month ago, it was something like six points in favor of a Republican Congress. The new one that just came out post post Dobbs, that's the Roe versus Wade decision last exactly. week, post yeah. Dobbs, is, uh, is, is switched around. And now it's something like six or seven percent by that margin want a Democratic Congress. So, uh, you know, that is uh, that is in, uh, you know, uh, with the red hot issue here, of course, of, uh, and, and the breaking news just five or six days old. Um, so there is that, but having said that, I mean, I question whether, I mean, there's a long time between this is June. So, you know, we've got another six months and, uh, you know, I think people, uh, let's face it, you know, every time they go to the gas pump and they're putting, uh, you know, they're putting fuel in their tank, uh, they're mad and, uh, uh, whether it's fairly or not, and there's many, many reasons why we have inflation, of course, right now, but fairly or not, people tend to blame the in party for these things because they don't know how else to, uh, target their anger. So, uh, the economy, although in some ways it's perceived as being a lot worse than it actually is, sure. is, uh, you know, is on the table, these bread and butter things that people feel that they're seeing in their lives every day. And this is not by, and I'm, what I'm about to say is not by any, by any means stretch of the imagination, trying to minimize any people who are really going to be impacted mm-hmm. seriously by this Dobbs decision. Uh, but there are a lot of people who, uh, there are a lot of, I don't know, older voters, uh, who, uh, who don't, you know, um, is, uh, nobody in their family is, uh, you know, is, is on the, on the, is in the market for getting an abortion mm-hmm. or they live in, or they live in blue states where it's still going to be legal because if we're going state by state. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's a, it's a complicated picture. It really kind of comes down to for the midterms in my mind, you know, what are the things that people feel are going to impact their everyday lives the most? Uh, and th- you know, that's not to say that, that Republic, that Democrats, excuse me, might not be able to, uh, mobilize around, uh, what happened with Roe v. Wade, but, um, you know, and there's marches now, uh, and they want to galvanize people to, to come out and vote on that. And Democrats are saying, well, this is a chance that we can get, you know, suburban women, uh, on our side. Uh, and, uh, Donald Trump apparently was on record a few days ago, uh, th- through the grapevine as saying he's, he wonders whether this decision is actually going to hurt Republicans. Um, I, I would just, I would just add a lot of caveats to any, you know, knee jerk, <laughs> knee jerk optimism that Democrats have. And, and I'll add one other thing. It's just that over, over time, um, it's been demonstrated that the most fervent voters on the issue of abortion, the ones that put it at the top of the priority list, uh, tend to be uh, against abortion. Uh, right. So are we going to all of a sudden see an historic shift? Uh, that'd be a heck of a story. Um, that would explain why state legislators lean, uh, legislatures lean Republican. Uh, and we have this sort of situation in our hands right now is that uh, the the voters with a cause, and in this case, it seems to have been conservative voters, are much more likely to flood the polls, much more likely to put their people in office than the people who, uh, you know, say, "Hey, I like things the way they are." Uh, it it just makes me think of of my wife, who was in radio news as well, talking to somebody a few years ago about a threat here in Pennsylvania to abortion, and she was talking to one of the uh, women who, who ran, um, the uh, abortion activists, um, and, and saying, Are, aren't you worried that this is going to overturn Roe v. Wade? And she said, we've got the law on our side. We don't have to worry. 
Yeah. My wife was was yeah. worried that she was a little too complacent about the whole thing. Well, I think I, I would add one other thing that I think dovetails with what you just said about Pennsylvania. And we can't forget, you know, when we talk about the midterms, people generally are referring to House and Senate. But we have to uh, prioritize in many ways gubernatorial races. And the gubernatorial race in yeah. Pennsylvania is going to be one of the, you know, marquee uh, campaigns this fall, you know, Doug, Mas uh, Doug Mastriano, the, the, uh, um, Republican uh, candidate, uh, who's also been an election denier, uh, and marched in John January 6th. Uh, he's also, uh, you know, fervently on the abortion. And he's basically, you know, he's basically, you know, if we're talking about in a post, uh, row atmosphere that this thing being fought out state by state, well, if Mastriano wins, and you have a Republican legislature in Harrisburg, which is always the case. But you will, you know, yeah. right? What's going to get passed? What's going to get passed through the legislature? You know, pretty darn quick. And and what's how, what's that? Where's that going to leave women uh, who live in Pennsylvania and and the uh, you know and, and and our health professionals? Um, so you know that race is going to be huge. And you know I would think uh, that uh, that uh, Josh Shapiro, the Democratic candidate. Uh, if he isn't already, I haven't seen any ads lately, but if he isn't already, I'm sure this is going to play into uh, his strategy too, to, to talk he about ads. I, he's I will the last. Say, oh yes. Yeah. Hasn't he done an ad that's saying he's, he, he's the, he's the last bastion of, uh, oh, I forget what the term is. Yeah. He, he had ads, uh, during the primaries that were sponsored by Shapiro saying Doug Mastriano is going to te tear this state apart. Uh, is that go. really what you want? But that was uh, Josh Shapiro running as a Democrat with no opposition, putting out an ad during the primaries saying that he didn't, you know, do you really want Doug Mastriano as your, as your Republican candidate? So, yeah, I mean, he's thinking ahead at least that far mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to stop this thing. I mean, it's a, it's, it's remarkable. And I don't mean to extend this out too much in one direction, but I think it's, it's important to mention. And I think Don and I were saying this uh, on a recent podcast also that Pennsylvania is a, a really important state all of a sudden, uh, not only because it might be one where uh, maybe a Democrat can uh, take over uh, a Republican Senate seat in the U S Senate, but also the gubernatorial elections and uh it, you know, and also suddenly several of our, uh, our state Congress people are uh, on the spot. We haven't even talked about the January 6th uh, commission yet, but uh, we've been hearing uh, several Pennsylvania names in there. So suddenly it seems like, right. Uh, That's right. uh, you know, uh, <laughs> doing very strange things, these guys. Do, well, doing. yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, if you're looking at the map of swing states, so just looking at 2024 presidential election, you know, Pennsylvania is one of the key uh, swing states in, in play. And, uh, you know, uh, if Mastriano gets in, uh, what's that going to do for, you know, if you have, uh, uh, I don't know, if the Democrat wins, whoever that might be, uh, in 2024, is he going to get cer certified if Mastriano was governor? Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think one of the term, one of the people you were mentioning, one of the congressmen, Scott Perry, uh, was, uh, you know, his name was floated last week as one of the people who was one of the congressmen who was looking for a pardon, a preemptive pardon not that he thinks he did anything wrong but he was asking for a pardon anyway <laughs> we'll be right back to our podcast in just a moment but first here's a soothing musical interlude Dick Coleman is Maury Povich writer in residence and professor of journalism at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's been since 2006. From 1992 to 2006, he was national political writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, covering presidential elections from 1992 to 2008. He was also political columnist at the Inquirer, and from 2012 to 2019, he was a columnist on WHYY-FM. Follow his work at dickpullman.net, that's D-I-C-K-P-O-L-M-A-N.net, and check out his University of Pennsylvania webpage at www.english.upenn.net. Dot edu slash people slash dick hyphen Holman. And now we return you to the musical inner tube. You know, it's interesting that um, I, I agree with you that the, the Democratic Party has been uh, really genius at turning uh, opportunity into catastrophe uh, or just missing opportunity completely. Um, but they also have these, you would have thought that we have the commission, uh, the commission hearings, which, 
Um, I'm not sure that there is an objective viewpoint, but to stand back and look at it, it seems as though they've got some pretty, pretty great stuff. Uh, yeah, and that, yeah. that should be part of any discussion that, uh, you, uh, you know, I think that it makes one party look not real great, you know? Right. I'll, right. You know? Well, uh, yes. I mean, here, this is the other, we, we should factor that into the whole midterm discussion. Uh, you know, does, all right. So does, uh, you know, what's more, I mean, I'll put it in the starkest, weirdest terms, but what's more important, how much money it costs for a gallon or the future of the democratic traditions, uh, in the, in the, in the West, in the West's oldest democ <laughs> democracy. Uh, right. you know, I mean, I know, I know it feels abstract probably still to a lot of people, but, uh, there's, um, uh, George, uh, George W. Bush is, uh, former pollster whose name is uh, Matthew Dowd. He's yep. uh, out of, out of Texas. Good follow, good person to follow on Twitter. He was basically arguing. I mean, I, I don't know if he was arguing this as a strategist or just as a sort of as a moral position, but he was saying that Democrats should be hammering away at the January 6th hearings and the repercussions of it and the reverberations of it, uh, every day between now and November. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that's strongest about these hearings, uh, is, um, and I'm sure you guys have seen, uh, the brilliance really of the hearings is that virtually every single witness, whether it's in a, a videotape deposition or live, has been a conservative Republican and or Trump aide of one kind or another. You know, there, you know, they don't have to put, I don't know, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren or, or Nancy Pelosi in there or whatever. You know, the, 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 the evidence is coming from, you know, the call is coming from inside the house, as the horror movies always say. Right. These are all, you know, these are, I mean, uh, this, I forget one, there's one lawyer. I think his name is Hirschman, who's always been on the, uh, uh, he's always oh, yeah. been uh, videotaped, and I, I, I consider that guy the winner of the uh, guy you want to most have a beer with, because he's always just he's, <laughs> he's he's telling off all these other these other people, you know, these nutcases like John Eastman, uh, and and, and you know, in, in the most purple fr uh, purple words that you've ever heard. Oh on, yeah, uh, basic, yeah, on he basic cable. Yeah, you he's know? the one that's that's saying you're out of your effing mind. Yeah, that's uh, the guy. Yeah, for for all these people. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. And it, I and, think and, that it's been very. Uh, you make a good point, Dick. It's been very dramatic to see a certain kind of Republican uh, who is is absolutely aghast at what January sixth almost meant. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, who take very seriously that this was a direct uh, threat. To democracy, it certainly broke uh, a national tradition of forever, where we never had any kind of uprising after a vote. The vote uh, was basically uh, dispositive, and we we we've had very few uh, uprisings because of it. And okay, they didn't really do it very well, and they were a bunch of clowns and bozos. But it was still thousands of people storming the Capitol. I mean, it's it it breaks the. Uh, you know, it breaks it breaks that long unbroken tradition. It, it makes it seem like anything could be in danger. Well, you know, one of the most chilling things is the, um, and I'm gonna I, I want to quote the person who wrote this. It wasn't me. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, Barton Gelman. I think is his name in the Atlantic magazine. He wrote a piece some months ago, basically saying, you know, look, what happened on January 6th was a dress rehearsal. You know, for 2024, and. You know, and, and I think that's one of the points that uh, Lynn Cheney in particular has been uh, on the committee has been pushing that, you know, this isn't just a look back. This is also this is a look back in the context of looking ahead and warning about what might be ahead if, uh, you know, unless everybody unless the Justice Department indicts or hopefully they will. Um, but, you know, that that's the key part of this whole thing. And, and I think one of the most effective aspects of the hearing that's helping this get through to people, because one of the things I think that the hearing has done, there's been polling evidence showing that uh, an increasing percentage of Americans now believe that uh, uh, Trump committed a crime uh, and that it was orchestrated and coordinated. And they're taking it more seriously, according to the polls, just in the last few weeks. And I think one of the reasons for that is also just the way, and I've been impressed with this just as a, if nothing else, a TV viewer, the way it's been, the way these, these hearings have been presented, the way they've been laid out. I think they've been very easy for people to comprehend the way they're cutting together, uh, the testimony clips, uh, and, uh, the way that, uh, uh, 
you know, they're, they're uh, limiting the number of committee people who are talking at, at any one particular hearing. You know, they're all taking their turns, basically, hearing by hearing. Whereas, as you guys know, uh, and, and I'm, I remember, I'm old enough to remember the Watergate hearings and, yeah. and so many hearings since. I mean, look what happens typically in hearings. Everybody gets their five or ten minutes of ego and they, you know, a lot of times make these long rambling statements and then you go on to the next person uh, and then the other side gets it. And, you know, I remember vividly the Watergate hearings, uh, you know, it took the hearings were on for about five weeks before John Dean gave his testimony. That's what everybody remembers. John Dean's yep. testimony. Well, he had to listen for five weeks and it was a lot of the stuff was pretty forgettable uh, yep. and abstruse. Uh, so we're not getting that now. These are very, very tightly organized. And and I have to also give credit to, uh, <laughs> perverse credit, to House Minority Leader uh, Kevin McCarthy for screwing up uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the formation uh, yeah. of, uh, you know, of the, of this thing, because originally there was a, a, a proposal to have a bipartisan commission that was not even going to be filled with people in Congress. Uh, and they shot that down and apparently Trump was against it too, from the sidelines. Uh, and then he, you know, and then he wanted to just put, you know, uh, uh Jim Jordan and some of these, you know, characters, uh, um, on this, on the committee that was good to be, you know, the, the one that's now formed and, uh, Pelosi, you know, said no, because his special committee, she had it, but instead of having other people on there who might've been at least, uh, uh, who might have at least defended Trump to some extent, evidence notwithstanding, uh, uh, he, he pulled out, he pulled right. out of it. So they were able, as you, you know, they were able to just basically form the thing the way they wanted to. And so, you know, you're getting, you know, basically the way it feels like to me, you're getting essentially a pro, a, pro, a prosecutor's case. Yes. Let me ask you two questions about the, uh, the January 6th hearings. Um, number one, um, do we need a John Dean? We've already had a lot of, of Trump's own uh, advisors uh, on this testimony. You know, you're right on, on tape telling uh, the committee. Yeah, this guy was nuts and he's out of touch with reality. Bill Barr comes to mind. Yeah. Bill but Barr. The, the other, so if, you know, so we have that, we had the John Dean sort of uh, thing in there, but is there anything that the committee can come up with that will take the Trump supporters who are probably with their fingers in the ears going, no, 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 like they can't hear anything. Mm -hmm. Anything that would turn them to a situation where they might start thinking, yeah, this guy's a little nuts and, and we got to back away from him. Well, I mean, that's, you know, before the hearing started, I remember writing a column saying, uh, who's going to be listening to this, you know, and who's going to be uh, taking it on board and, and maybe changing their minds. You know, I think, just to just to go back to uh, Richard Nixon for a little bit of context, uh, I remember after Watergate and after Nixon's resignation, there was still a hardcore twenty five percent of Americans who uh, didn't think Nixon did anything wrong and uh, stood by him and and wished he hadn't resigned and thought the Democrats were just out to get him, etc. Um, so I I don't know what the percentage is in now, is now, but obviously there's just going to be sort of a you know, a hardcore percentage that is, that is completely unpersuadable. And you almost have to basically at this point, write them off and just imagine and just hope if you are in the majority that that hardcore can be outvoted mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and because there's really nothing that's going to change their minds. I would, I would think perhaps uh, if uh I don't know. I would, if Trump had actually shot somebody on Fifth Avenue, but even then, they'd probably say they they'd probably say the ballistics came from the uh, you know from the Democratic headquarters across the street. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so and and on so but on the John on the John Dean question, um, I think you make a good point. You know, I think in some ways we've had many John Deans already, uh, and much more dramatic uh, John Deans already. Uh, you know, the only person I can think of possibly. Uh, who might make a difference, and this is probably marginal too, is they were trying to get uh, the, the um, and, and Liz Cheney made an appeal to uh, Pat Cipollini, who I believe was one of the top or is the, was the top White House counsel, uh, and, and, and whereas all the other ones were all testifying, you know, and the people from the D Department of Justice were testifying the other day. And so Pat Cipollini was in the room on the inside 
uh, and, uh, and has so far, uh, uh, not agreed to, to testify, uh, to be, to try to at least come up with a serious answer rather than a flip one about Fifth Avenue. Um, if they somehow had evidence that directly, directly tied Trump as, you know, ordering violence or, you know, that Trump was on the phone with the Proud Boys or, or some of those people. I know they have links to White House people and they've, they've talked about how they're going to show that in, in hearings, uh, coming up. Uh, but I think the case against Trump is basically that he just, that he was passive and didn't do anything to stop it. I don't know if they have anything that was proactive that he ordered it. Perhaps that would make a difference. I can't yeah. think of anything else that would make any kind of a difference. Having said all that, there's also some interesting polling lately that is showing that there are people, uh, sort of MAGA, you know, make America great again, pe MAGA people who, Maybe uh, toying with the idea of embracing Trumpism without Trump, and that might be something that's turning because there was a, a test, a test poll the other day in New Hampshire, of course, one of our first primary states, uh, of testing him against uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Yes, and, right. Yeah, and last month Trump was up over DeSantis in like a sort of a head-to-head -head poll by a sizable amount. I don't know, eight or nine points. The latest one that just came out the other day had DeSantis over Trump. And that was the first time that anybody is, that I've seen that anyway. Uh, and, uh, and it might be a sign that some people are, you know, just kind of edging away a little bit. You know, um, I think that's what Mike Pence is gambling on. Mike Pence is kind of playing a long-term game where he kind of thinks, okay, well, you know, yeah, maybe they did try to hang me, but maybe I can appeal to them anyway. Uh, so, I mean, that, he, he's going to be a really interesting person to watch, I think. It does show how very hard it is to establish that black unbroken line between Trump and collusion, if you know what I mean. It's, we've got a great circumstantial case going. I, I think everyone uh -huh. would admit, you know, that there was a president who made incendiary comments. He probably stopped short of telling people to go kill but he did say, we're going to march up the avenue and I'll be with you. And then, of course, he retired to his office and did nothing further. Having said that, though, it sort of shows how hard it is to make, you know, the kind of direct charge stick, as you, I think, just in, uh, you know, sort of in implied that we don't have that quite yet. Yeah. But, you know, there are um, there are in the federal criminal code, there are conspiracy statutes uh, and there are statutes about that it's illegal to defraud the government or to impede the operation of the government. Um, there's, there's three or four different, uh, statutes. And, uh, from time to time in my columns, I've quoted from some of them. Uh, a and y you don't necessarily, you can make, you know, you can make a strong circumstantial case in court and win with it. Uh, it it's just a question really of, uh, you know, I think um, uh, what the Justice Department people who are, who are looking at this is not just Merrick Garland, but he's got an entire staff of people who are really looking at this so closely. Uh, um, you know, I think what their their attitude basically is what's what's there's an old medieval saying. Uh, I don't know if it's medieval, maybe it's modern, but um, that if you come at if you come at the king, you better you better not miss. Yes, yeah, exactly. You know, right. and I think they got one. You know, they want if they're going to have a sh take a shot at, if they're going to be uh, indicting a former president of the United States, uh, they want to be a hundred percent sure that they can win with it. And you know, um, uh, so far at least, they don't have to really, you know, until the committee plays out and they get a hold of what the committee has as well, they don't really have to make that decision yet. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. but but I I do think I I do think the way the polls are looking and the way that most people are. Uh, at least the majority are looking at what the committee has presented. I think there would be quite the uproar if there was no indictment at this point. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I, I, let's look at the future then um, uh, uh, as far as uh, the, the 2024 election and that sort of thing goes. Um, even if Trump doesn't run, who do the Democrats have? Would they run Joe Biden again or would they want to get somebody else in there? Uh, and if somebody else, who would – match well with whoever the Republicans will put up, whether it be Trump or DeSantis or somebody else. And, yeah. and, 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 would, and would the American public be in favor of going back to the progressive ways and moving away from the, from the, 
uh, conservative uh, roll back the clock things that we've been going through the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it's tough with, you know, Biden has been uh, the subject of two, two um, long pieces recently. I think New York Magazine and New York Times also uh, have done pieces in recent weeks where, where uh, Democrats are starting, you know, uh, anonymously uh, to uh, raise uh, doubts about uh, Biden's viability in 2024. Um, and, uh, you know, part of it is, and they don't necessarily want to say this, you know, part of it's his age and he'll be, you know, well into his eighties if he was in a second term. Uh, you know, and this is going to sound, this is going to sound like a superficial observation on my part. So I cop to this. Uh, but a lot of people look at optics and, you know, to a lot of people, he, he, to a lot of people, he looks, he looks old on television and there's so much turmoil now. And it's like, you know, do we, do we want somebody, you know, who is, who is dynamic and energetic and doesn't look like, you know, the last vestiges of an old democratic party? Uh, you know, so these are these, these, you know, these telegenic things matter in, 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 in a, in a visual society that we have. So, so having said that, um, the question then becomes, you know, who, you know, cause part of the problem is, you know, who is going to want to, uh, from the side of, of potential candidates, who's going to want to potentially pop their, you know, their heads, you know, above ground, uh, and, uh, in a way that, uh, it could expose themselves to the ire of uh, a sitting president and, and the, the sizable number of people still within the Democratic Party that are committed to and, and support. Uh, this this sitting president so you know so that slows you know they, that kind of freezes things for quite a while here uh and and people you know democrats who might be interested in something like that uh i don't know i'm, I'm going to throw elizabeth warren's name out there again since that's certainly from the left side of the party um they're going to be looking to see what happens in the midterms and they're going to looking be watching his poll numbers and if inflation goes down or not etc you know whether they can whether they can afford politically within the party uh, to make a move. Uh, so, you know, I don't I don't know who it would be. I mean, I see all these names thrown out there, Pete Buttigieg, and you know, Pete Buttigieg is you know he, he owes his job and he has been loyal to Biden. He's not going to do anything. Someone like that's not going to do anything. You know, unless he gets some kind of signal from Biden at some point that Biden's not going to go for a second term. And for all we for all we know, he's decided that. But he's not going to say anything for quite a while, so so it's a it's a very fluid it's it's a very fluid situation. I, I think what the Democrats really need, if if nothing else, is you know they need somebody who breaks the old party paradigm. You know the whole the whole party hierarchy in in Congress and in the White House, you know, are are like from two or three generations old at this point. Um, and you know, and they need someone who's, and they certainly need someone who's going to be able to mobilize and draw young people to the polls. Uh, voters under the age of 30 are really down on Biden right now for whatever their long set of reasons are. Uh, and the Democrats can't win in 2024 unless they have a huge turnout among younger voters. Hey, musical intertubers, we want to give a shout out to one of our newest friends in the podcast universe, Isaac Klein. His podcast is called Vanity, the stories behind the plates, and it is a really great listen. Like a lot of us, Isaac and his spouse drive around and they read a lot of crazy license plates and they try to figure out what the heck they mean. Some of them seem straightforward at first. Edgar! 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 <laughs> Some of them we can't even begin to guess, which only makes us more curious. D. Yorming. D. No, it's a D. D. That's what I said. Um, no, D. Y. I mean, D. Happy face. Y. D. R. M. N. G. He decided to put out the word that he was making this into a podcast, and to his surprise, a lot of the plate owners got back to him. Isaac talks to the people behind the plates and learns what the backstory is. He soon finds out the story behind a vanity plate is never as simple as it first appears. Join Isaac for Vanity, available now at www.isaac-klein.com vanity 
or the Apple Store, Spotify, and wherever else good podcasts live. We give it the Musical Inner Tube seal of approval. And now we return you to the Musical Inner Tube. So, um, Dick, uh, I want to ask you two questions uh, really fast. I mean, I have to think... And and you know I I I think you were part of this discussion. This was back in two thousand one. We were all standing in the aisles uh, at the Inquirer, uh, a bunch of us. And by the way, folks, this is where the, some of the best and some of the worst decisions get made in a newspaper. But some of the best conversations certainly. And we were talking <laughs> about this thing that you hear every election year, where people just say, you know, there's no difference between the parties. It doesn't matter really who's elected. And we heard it in ninety two. We heard it in ninety six. 2000 was one that we heard it an awful lot, but I just don't see how people can ever say that again. <laughs> Knowing what we, you know what I mean? If you, if you look at what we're looking at, I'm not. Oh just, my God. I know. You know, I mean, I think that most of the Supreme court judges now sitting were print were, uh, were appointed by people who lost the uh, public vote. Uh, you know, they, uh, so it, it does show you, you know, if one, party has an opportunity it it tends to take it and it goes in very different directions from the other um it 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 seems like that one just doesn't have much of a life anymore but we've heard it every time every single time i i I know well those are uh, maybe it's just people who just are looking for a rationalization not to bother to vote uh but you know i'm just to sort of circle back to something we started with here at the end, now we can circle back, is about, you know, the, the Republicans were saying, f- in terms of prioritizing the court and what they wanted to do with the court and the direction they wanted to take the court, uh, which is now happening, they advertised out in the open for 40 years, hey, there are differences between the two parties. This is what we want to do. This is what we intend to do. This is where we're putting all our money and our message Election after election after election. They did it in 2002, Bush versus Gore. Uh, and they did it in 2016. So it's like, they, they've been telling us, they've been telling everybody, yeah, there are big differences between the two parties. Look at what we want to do. The Democrats don't want to do this. So this notion that people, I mean, I, I don't want to pick on, you know, uh, I want to pick on Susan Sarandon, the actress, uh, any, any, any more that she, but you know, she's such a classic example of that. When she was going to her vote for Jill Stein in 2016, she goes, oh, I'm not concerned. I don't think there's that much difference between, you know, uh, it won't make that much difference between Trump and, uh, Hillary, whoever, whoever gets in. Uh, and, and that's how she was basing her vote. And people who voted for, for Jill Stein or people in 2000 who said, nah, there's no difference between Bush and Gore. Oh, and so in, and so in Florida, they voted for, uh, for, uh, Ralph Nader, you know, who got 93,000 votes. And, and the, and the official margin was 527 votes or something between Bush and Gore. And, and then we, we get the Iraq war and we have, you know, thousands of Americans and hundred thousand or plus Iraqis killed. So, you know, I don't know. All, all I can say, and, and I guess I'm just saying this as somebody who follows politics closely. So I'm not the average person. But to me, when people say that nah, there's no difference between the parties, it doesn't matter who gets in. To me, those are just people who, who they're looking for an excuse not to pay attention. And, uh, you know, I, I wish we had what Australia had. I, you know, Australia, you have to vote. It's mandatory. Of course, then again, who knows if everybody would, <laughs> if everybody who didn't know what was going on voted, maybe we'd be in the same boat. I don't know. <laughs> well, Dick Pullman, it has been, as we knew it would be, uh, a bracing half hour uh, with you. And we want to thank you. We hope you'll come again. I, I think there's going to be more to talk about as we go through the political year 2022. It's always fun to it's it's always fun to talk. It's so much easier than writing. I can't tell you. <laughs> well, thanks for being on the musical inner tube. Okay, yeah, thanks. Dick. All right, see you guys. Thank you for listening to the musical inner tube. Check out our website at musicalintertube.com, where you'll find all our episodes, profiles of our guests, and lots of extras. You'll even be able to leave us a voicemail. Our email address is musicalintertube at gmail.com. And on Twitter, our handle is M Inner Tube. Capitalize the M and the I.
The InnerTube is available on Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio Podcasts. Like us and give us a good review on any of those platforms. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.